Naomi Oreskes, the history, uh, professor of history of science at Harvard University, a co-author with Eric Conway of The Big Myth, a new book, How American Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market, a, 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 a brilliant piece of work. Uh, Na Naomi Oreskes, O-R-E-S-K-E-S -E on Twitter. Um, and of course, the book is available wherever you find uh, fine books. Their previous book is Merchants of Doubt, by the way, which we've talked about on this program. Naomi, welcome to the program. Tell us about how corporate America first, when, at what point in time uh, did corporate America first start this uh, laissez-faire, uh, neoliberal, uh, you know, Friedman and Hayek type of sales pitch? Uh, did it precede the, the you know, the, the, the meetings in Switzerland and, and uh, the, the 1936 meeting in France? Yes, our book covers more than 100 years of history. What we show in the book is that the construction of the myth of the magic of the marketplace actually begins in the early 20th century. And the book you were just talking about a minute ago is a good lead into ours. In the late 19th century, American capitalism was rapacious. Uh, the free market had actually led to the destruction of competition and the rise of giant monopolies and trusts. And it had also led to massive exploitation of workers, including child labor. And so reformers in the late 19th and early 20th century, what's often referred to as the progressive era, reformers that included both progressive Republicans and Democrats, worked to try to make American capitalism more civilized to protect competition through the Sherman and Clayton Antitrust Acts, and to protect workers through the development of workmen's compensation and laws against child labor. These were like Republicans, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, William Howard right. Taft. Yes, exactly. Many of these reformers were progressive Republicans. Teddy Roosevelt's an important person in the story. Gifford Pinchot, the governor of Pennsylvania and the first director of the Forest Service. And in response to these attempts at reform, American business tried to fight back. And they tried to fight back by beginning, starting the beginnings of what would become a hundred year long propaganda campaign to deny the appropriate role of government in the marketplace, to deny the appropriate role of government in protecting workers and in protecting competition, and to tell a myth, to construct a myth uh, that markets were wise, that markets were efficient, and we should just trust the marketplace to make appropriate decisions on our behalf. I, you know, I find it, an extraordinary leap of um, illogic, I suppose, <laughs> that marketplaces cannot exist uh, outside of, you know, simple barter without a government. You know, you, you have to have government to define the, the currency and the value of the currency. You have to have government to define the rules of what is a legitimate versus a fraudulent transaction. You have to have government to provide a mechanism for redress uh, when someone is the, the victim of fraud. Um, you have, I mean, it, 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 it's like it's like suggesting that we we could play the National Football League could play football without rules, uh, or right. that it, if the rule was just that whichever team gave the most money to the NFL got to have an extra player on the field and and uh, could ignore you know any three random rules they wanted or something like that. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. How 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 exactly so, how could they sell so this? Well, so the core of the myth is the construction of the notion of the free market, the idea that there could even be such a thing as a free market that exists apart from society. So as you say, markets have been around since time immemorial. We know there were markets in ancient Greece and Rome and ancient Assyria. As far as we can tell, there have been markets as long as there has been human civilization, and they have always had rules and regulations because markets don't exist apart from the societies that they're part of. They're human mechanism, uh, and like any human activity, whether it's football or driving a car, uh, we have rules about how these activities should take place. You can even find rules about markets in the Old Testament. But the myth, the construction of the myth, begins with the idea that there even could be such a thing as the free market, which exists unto itself, um, which has wisdom, uh, and which is anthropomorphized even into a sort of godlike character, so that when we talk about the invisible hand of the marketplace, the implication is that the market is almost godlike, and so we should trust in the marketplace in a kind of quasi-religious fashion. And that's why ref we refer to this ideology as market fundamentalism, because it has this quasi-religious faith-based component. And, and that phrase, the, the invisible hand of the marketplace, comes from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. It, it only occurs once in that book. It occurs in the context of what arguably is an argument for 
uh, you know, uh, protective trade policy, <laughs> essentially. Um, and, and, it, and it completely, the way it's been misused and misinterpreted, I know you're right about this in your book, The Big Myth. We're talking with Naomi Oreskes. Um, it, it's, it completely contradicts not only much of Wealth of Nations, but almost all of a theory of moral sentiments, which really was Adam Smith, you know, that was the work he was most proud of and, and, and probably most well known for, at least at the time of the American Revolution. Um, how, again, how, how, did, how, how have, where did this begin? I mean, was it, was it, um, I know, you know, Reagan was pushing this stuff and you write about this, you know, with the General Electric Theater and traveling around the country, there were, they were, uh, General Motors was reprinting, um, a, a cartoon version of Hayek's book and, and sending them out to people. Did this really get rolling in a big way in the United States in the 1950s? Was that the era? No, it's actually much earlier. So the story begins in the early 20th century with arguments over child labor and workmen's compensation. Right. Uh, many people today don't really realize how how violent, how deadly, how dangerous American capitalism was. Millions of American workers were killed or injured on the job every year, and they received no recompense. So workmen's compensation was a reform put in place to make workplaces safer because it was found that when uh, business leaders, when factory owners had to pay premiums into a workman's compensation system, it gave them an incentive to make the workplace safer. So this was a positive reform that worked. It, make work, it made workplaces safer and more efficient. Um, but a lot of business leaders opposed it because they saw it as an infringement on their rights, their prerogatives, their freedoms. And so they begin this campaign to construct a story about capitalism and freedom, to claim that any compromise of economic freedom, any compromise of the rights of businessmen, factory owners to run their businesses as they saw fit, would put us on a kind of slippery slope to Soviet-style totalitarianism. Now, how can they make this story work when it's so obviously self-interested and when the facts don't support it? Well, because the facts don't support it, because the evidence doesn't support it, they have to try to shore it up. And one of the ways they do that is by recruiting academics. And so they recruit two of the leaders, two of the founders of neoliberalism, the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek, and they bring them to America and they begin to promote their work in the 1930s and 40s. And in the 1930s, von Mises serves as a consultant to one of the leading trade organizations in the United States, the National Association of Manufacturers, who are a key player in the story, and by the way, are still a key player today in denying climate change mm -hmm. and blocking climate action. So they recruit them, they bring them to America, and they begin to promote a kind of boldlerized version of their views. So if you actually read von Hayek's most famous book, The Road to Serfdom, published in 1944, um, you may or may not agree with it, but it's a pretty sophisticated book. It's pretty thoughtful. And one of the things that von Hayek says is, well, there are places where it is appropriate for the government to be engaged in the marketplace, for example, preventing deforestation, preventing the harmful effects of pollution, or possibly even some form of social insurance to help workers. Remember, this is coming out of the Great Depression, to help workers in in cases of extreme need. So Hayek is ideological. The work is a piece of ideology, but he's not a nut. Mm -hmm. But in the hands of his American acolytes, he becomes a kind of nut. They produce a Reader's Digest version of his work that takes out all the caveats about how you actually do need laws against pollution and deforestation, and you actually do need social insurance. And they turn him into this very flat and very one-sided, one-dimensional, um, advocate of, you know, free markets, uber alles, and government is evil, government is bad. And that's the piece of the story that then they propagandize. Right. And then, and then uh, uh, Reagan and friends carry, carry it forward. How do we, how do right. we push back on this? What's, what's the most effective um, uh, counter, counter narrative or counter story? Or is, have you, have you encountered one? Well, I think that uh, mold grows in dark places, and all of my work has really been about shedding light on important social, political, and scientific issues. So one of the things we learned when we wrote Merchants of Doubt, which is a book about climate change denial, is that when you explain to people that climate change denial isn't about the science, that it's a political claim and it's not supported by the evidence, and that it's actually a kind of a con trying to persuade mm -hmm. people that somehow the interest of ExxonMobil is the interest of us. 
When you expose that, a lot of people say, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And nobody wants to be on the losing end of a con. Nobody wants to be a sucker. And so I think we have a somewhat similar story here. This is a story of a hundred year long propaganda campaign to persuade the American people to trust big business to have our backs when the history shows that they don't. And so I think that when people begin to understand that this is propaganda, it makes them see it in a different light. And it's interesting because most of us, when we hear the word propaganda, we think government propaganda. But what we haven't really realized is that there's also big business propaganda. And this is a story about business propaganda that has been highly impactful, highly influential, and has really stood in the way of a lot of important reforms that we need today to fight problems like the climate crisis, the opioid crisis, uh, income inequality, the lack of affordable housing, and so many other issues that really affect the lives of the American people. Yeah, it, it truly is. The book is The Big Myth, the subtitle How American Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market by Naomi Oreskes and Eric M. Conway. Uh, uh, available wherever fine books are available. Merchants of Doubt, the preceding book. Naomi, thank you so much for dropping by and, and sharing this conversation and these insights with us. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a pleasure, pleasure having you on.